So last week, we, we slowed gears down. We had a communion service, which was intimate. It was special. And it was really for us just a reminder of what Jesus has done for us. I don't know about you, but I'm guilty of sometimes forgetting the weight of what actually happened, of the fact that God became man and he gave himself for my freedom, for my eternity, that I'm now guilty in his sight. And, and that's incredible. And so we spoke about communion. And so I thought today I want to do my, my level best to, to kind of explain what does it mean to be saved. Speaking about salvation, and obviously that's what we celebrate at communion time, but, but I want to start saying this, just to, to get us going, that speaking about immeasurably more, you are loved immeasurably more than what you can imagine. You are loved immeasurably more than what you can imagine. Whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, you are loved by God. And, and each one of us, if, if we'd be honest with ourselves, we know that to be loved is the deepest cry of our hearts. Guys, you too, don't worry, you're not that tough. All of us want to be loved and accepted, and especially by God. And the truth is, He does love us more than what we know. You know, dis decisions in life are big, right? You and I have, and will continue to make massive decisions in life of where we're going to study, where we're going to work, where we're going to live, who we're going to marry. Listen, those are important decisions, right? And it's decisions we get to make. It's not decisions that God makes for us. But the biggest decision that you and I make in our lives is the decision to follow Jesus, to actually respond to the grace of God. And so we speak about the word salvation. I did some research and I found out that there is a TV series called Salvation. Never watched it, but it's out there. Uh, there's a charity we all know by the name of the Salvation Army. The word is used there. I found out there's a clothing brand called Salvation. There is a small town, I think, in KwaZulu-Natal, if I'm correct, that is called Salvation. And then there is, in Johannesburg, a restaurant called Salvation, Salvation Cafe, which you have to go to. It is the best food in Joburg, I think, at its price. It's on Empire Road, 44 Stanley, Auckland Park. So I'm giving them a free promo today. They can give me the, the royalties later on. But um, the word salvation, and it's a, it's a well-known word, but do we really grasp what... It means, so, so in its basic form, what is salvation? Salvation is to, what, rescue someone out of danger and into safety. It's like, well, that's obvious. And so we think of a lifeguard, right? We all think of that's how you are saved. And so three things are needed in this situation. Number one, a dangerous reality. In our case, water. Secondly, you need a victim. Then you need a savior. And what happens in this scenario? The stronger one the lifeguard goes and helps the person down, drowning in the dangerous reality of water and does what? He or she lifts them up and puts them on a place of safety. They, they literally rescue that person from death. Now salvation, that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. That he is our spiritual lifeguard that has lifted us up and he has helped us avoid two unavoidable realities. What are they? The penalty of sin and the punishment of sin. Of death. Think about this. These are two unavoidable realities that all of us face. We've all done and will do things that we know we shouldn't do, and we will all one day die, right? They say two guarantees are taxes and death. You will die. But listen, that's not the end of anyone who hopes in Jesus. And He has paid the price for us, and, and He has given us eternal life. He, he's helped us confront those two unavoidable realities. He's, he's come to us like a spiritual life God and lifted us up. And now this is obvious, but I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would refresh our hearts and our minds this morning, that maybe we could just leave today with a, a greater appreciation for what Jesus has done. You know, David prayed, restore to me the joy of my salvation. It tells us that you and I can actually grow cold and, and, and forget, and, and forget to feel what salvation actually does to us. And so my, my prayer is that you would be refreshed. Now, when we speak about salvation, we obviously have to speak about the reality of sin as we have. And now we go back to the beginning, Adam and Eve. And most of us think the Bible begins with the fall. Now, we know creation is there, but the emphasis is really on what Adam and Eve did wrong. And so the emphasis becomes what? The fall. Do you know that that's not where God's story started? God's story started not with the fall, but with friendship. That was God's starting point, friendship. 
and it remains and will always be God's original plan to have what? Friendship with us. God is not the God that many think is up in heaven and is angry at humanity. No, he's, he's, he's saying, I want to have friendship with the world that I created. And, and here's the best known friendship verse in the Bible. You've never read it in your life. John 3.16 It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but what have eternal life. You're saying, I want to have friendship with you. See, God's tone toward us is not, I'm angry with you. He says, I want to have friendship with you. I love you immeasurably more than what you can imagine. And so Jesus really is like a spiritual life God, and he lifts us up out of the sea of sin and onto safe ground. That's what he and only he can do for us. Listen to Acts chapter 4, verse 12. It says, there is salvation. See, it's not foreign language to the scriptures. There is salvation in what? No one else. It's exclusive language. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. You see, you must be saved. Salvation is important, and it can't happen apart from Jesus. Jesus also said that I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He was very exclusive in his language because he knew I did for humanity what no other God or religion could ever do. Save them from the two unavoidable realities of sin and death. And so it tells us that not all roads lead to Rome. You can't serve whichever God you want and get to heaven. No, Jesus said, it is only through me that you can actually be saved. Every other God, every other religion is going to leave you to drown. Jesus says, I'm able to lift you up out of that water, that sea of sin. But now before salvation takes place, uh, maybe some of us know it, some of us maybe don't know it. But before the point where we decide, I'm going to choose to follow Jesus, remember it's a decision we make. It's not a decision God makes for us. He's told us in his part of the relationship, he's done what he can. He's emptied his pockets. He sent his son. He's told us, I love you. And I want relationship and friendship with you. But we need to respond. And before that response, there's a battle for our souls that takes place. Listen to, to this. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 and 6 says, Satan, now we know that we've got an enemy, right? Any Christian knows that. Satan, who is the God of this world, that can be puzzling. You think, well, isn't our God the one true God, like sovereign? Isn't he really God? But how can Satan be the God of this world? But it just, this here means that, listen, in reality, Christians, you and I represent the minority. And the majority of the world is actually ruled by philosophies and ideas and thinking and, and patterns and actions and habits and all these things and governments influenced by not God, but by Satan's thinking. That's how he is the God of this world. And it says, he, our enemy, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Now, it's not these eyes we know that he's talking about. It's the eyes of our hearts. It's a, it's a spiritual language that's being used. He said, they are unable. These are people we know. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news, Jesus. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we can know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. So we know that before you and I choose Jesus, there's a battle for our souls. God saying, I want your soul, all of you, 100%. We serve a jealous God. But then we know Satan says, I want to oppose everything that God has planned for you. And so I'm going to confuse you. I'm going to have a battle for your soul. And you and I can often be like this, like I want to follow God, but I know I want to go there. And it's, it's a wrestle for our souls that takes place. It's, it's massive what actually happens. And, and the truth is, without Jesus, you and I remain in the dark. And Scripture then says that we live ignorant and without hope. And then all we then do is live for this life in this world because we know no better. But it's when the grace of God comes, pierces through that darkness, we become enlightened. We, we gain knowledge of the truth and the truth sets us free. Then we are actually infused with this incredible hope that only Jesus can give us. And then we realize, I don't have to live only for this life. There's more to life than this world. You see, that, that salvation point changes how you and I live. Salvation doesn't mean you and I just start going to church. That's about this big in the story. Salvation is so much bigger. So another reminder, you are loved more, immeasurably more than you can imagine. And God wants friendship with you. You know, and it's as we respond to this grace of God, something mysterious happens. Something we don't see happen. 
in our hearts. Remember, it's an internal thing. Salvation is not an external thing. It eventually manifests outside, but it's something that happens on the inside of us. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, has chosen him, that is, grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he or she is a new creature. You're like, I'm not a creature. <laughs> like, I don't want to be called a creature. Other translations will say, a new creation. How do we explain that? That's a mystery. How does God make us a new creation? You know that, I think it was 17 years ago, I chose, I made that decision, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. You know that nothing changed on the outside. My hair color, still the same. I didn't get any shorter or taller. I'm the same thing. But what happened? I was, I was transformed on the inside. I was made a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. And listen here, it says the old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have what? Passed away. Behold, new things have come. Because spiritual awakening brings new life. And that's what revival is. That's where within us, either people who don't know God or those who know God and have grown cold, we need revival. We need God to, to breathe on us and awaken our spirits to the reality of who He is and what salvation is. It's so powerful. And you know, this whole being made a new creature, a new creation, for me, I best understand, in, imagine you and I have a spiritual DNA that God comes and He presses the reset button on. Who likes a reset button in life? You're like, reset my husband, reset my bank account. So you're like, we're like, or when you play video games and you're dying, you're like, I'll just quickly reset and I'll start again. That's exactly what Jesus does for our spirits. At the point when we believe in Jesus and what He's done, Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'm going to make you new. You get to start again. You don't go back to your mother's womb. As Nicodemus thought he had to and had to be born again, he's like, God, how's that going to happen? No, no, he's saying, no, it's something here. You have to be born again by your spirit, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. Now, that is a mystery. You and I can't see it, spirit, but we definitely can identify with the spirit. You know, other language in the Old Testament says uh, it's when we come to God, we, we receive a heart of flesh and he, he removes from us a heart of stone. So what happens when you and I are in the dark, ignorant, without hope, blinded by Satan, we can't see God. God comes, pierces through, and he, he does what? He says, without me, your heart was cold. It was insensitive to me. You didn't know how to live for me. You lived for yourself. But now that you know me and my love and the fact that I want to have friendship with you, he says, I'm going to give you a new heart, a new heart with new desires. And that heart's going to be soft and sensitive and warm towards God. Isn't that beautiful? And this new DNA that we get comes with new desires. Now, if you've truly made the decision to follow Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you've been filled with the Spirit, you know that that, that change, that decision gives you and I new desires. New desires. Paul said that we were once slaves to sin, but now we're slaves to righteousness. We, meeting Jesus changes the way that we live. Listen to 1 Peter 4. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically with, uh, for Christ, you have finished with sin. Listen, this is what I want to emphasize. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires. No one who encounters Christ continues to live for themselves. They begin to live for God and for others. It says, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. You will have this burning desire to do. I want to do only what God wants me to do. I don't want to do just what I want to do. I want to make God, my Father, happy. That's what this nature gives us. It says, you have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy. Their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties and their terrible worship of idols. Of course, I laugh at this, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do, and they slander you. Why? Because they're still in the dark. They don't know that there is a living hope, that Jesus can change everything. They're like, why don't you do what you used to do? Come on, man, just live this life. One life, live it. Just enjoy it. Eat, drink, and be merry. And you're like, no, 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 no. There's more to life than that. And listen, I've got a new nature, so I've got new desires. It's this new desire that, gives you and I an intolerance to sin. 
Many people have allergies. You know, if, if you drink milk, what happens? You get a response. You, you, you can't have milk or you can't have certain products or yeast or wheat or whatever it is because there's a reaction that you don't want that reaction, so you avoid the food. And so the spirit in us, this new nature that we get, gives us an intolerance. We become hypersensitive to sin where you, th where you see things that you used to do you're like, no ways. My new nature does, want, does not want that. I can't go there because I know how dangerous it is. It's not good for me to have those things. And that's not something you and I choose. It's the grace of God that changes us as he resets our spiritual DNA, that we become new creatures. And so it's true that our, our following Jesus is proved in us rejecting our old way of life. It must be apparent to others. People knew that there was a change in me and others when, why? When, when I said, I used to live this way, but I don't do those things anymore. I'm going this way. Why? Because I'm made new. We can't say that we're following Jesus and remain in an old life of sin. Then we're fooling ourselves. We're being hypocrites, right? Let's be honest. Jesus said, listen, are you going to be cold or are you going to be hot? Please don't be lukewarm. Choose which one you want to be. I had a youth leader. I laughed when he said it at first. I was like, are you allowed to say that? But he was true. He said, listen, if you're going to follow Jesus, be the best follower you can. But if you're going to be a sinner, please don't fool God. Be the best sinner that you can be. Just go all out, okay? I just, I'm a, that's, that's true. Don't sit on the fence. Choose. What did Joshua say? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose who you're going to serve. Don't, don't sit on the fence. But um, we need to reject certain things in our life. It's, it's, it's the fruit. It's the evidence that God has touched our lives. What's the, the, the biblical word for this? It's called repentance. We read in the Bibles, there's confession where you and I tell someone or tell God, I did something wrong. Sorry, I stole the chocolate cake. Okay, that's a confession. If you keep stealing the chocolate cake, you can't keep confessing. Sorry, I did it again and I did it again. You've got a problem. The, what you need to do is repent and say, I'm never going to steal chocolate cake again. And for most of us, we hear the word uh, repentance and we're like, oh, and we imagine some angry street preacher with a turn or burn poster. We wave and he's like, ah, and we're so scared of hell. We're like, ah, and we're like, oh, I better repent. Why? Out of fear, not out of faith. And repentance, all you and I need on repentance is perspective. Perspective changes everything. If you and I stood across from one another, I've got a picture to show you. If I stood here and I drew a number six, what would you see? And I would say, no, I have drawn a six. And you're like, Andrew, you have drawn a nine. I'm like, no, the only difference is perspective. In reality, this is what it is. It's a number six. You just need to come to this side and see it differently to know that this is actually a number six. And so you and I, when it comes to repentance, we need to just change our perspective and realize that it's not a terrifying threat, but a loving invitation from God the Father. It changes everything. I turn away from things, not because I'm scared of hell, it's because I want to please God my Father. It's an invitation to the abundant life that God offers us. It's not a ticket out of hell. That's not what repentance actually is. I want to read to you from... To Peter, it says this, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? People are like, it's been 2,000 years. Where's this God of you? He's promised to come. We're not seeing anything happen. And they, and they make light of it. But as Christians, we live with the hope of his return, right? He's come once. He will come again one last time. And, and we will be resurrected. That's the Christian hope that we, we live with. And it says, from before the time of our ancestors... Everything has remained the same since the world was first created. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. As a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. Listen, no, He's being patient for your sake. You see, the picture I get is God sitting in heaven now thinking, I want to come right now, like lunchtime today, 10th of July. Is it the 10th? 10th God is like, I want to come now, God's saying, no, I'm, I need to be patient. I need to restrain myself because he knows that there are still too many souls trapped in darkness. And he's saying, I'm being very patient. I, I can and I should have come long ago, but he, he's sitting on the edge thinking, just one more, just one more, just one more. Well, I just want more friendship. See, that's God's heart. I just want more friendship. And God is being patient. He was patient with me. Maybe he's being patient with you. He's being patient with people who aren't even near a church yet. He's saying, I'm, I'm waiting. Because why? Listen, he does not want anyone to be destroyed. Strong language, but the reality of hell is real. And he, Jesus is saying, I don't want anyone to go there. 
And listen, he's saying, you don't have to go there. I'm your spiritual life, God. I can't pick you up, but you need to reach out. If you neglect me, the reality remains that you and I will drown. He says he wants everyone to repent, but the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. And listen, you and I can avoid judgment by just believing in Jesus. Like, I'm not scared. If Jesus comes today, I'm not confident. Jesus has paid the price for my sin, the penalty of death. I'm good, God, let's go. I don't stand on my own merit. I'm like, God, was I a good boy? Was I a bad boy? Oh, I'm so scared what you're going to say. I'm like, no, Jesus has me covered. My confidence is in him, not in myself. And so the choice is ours. Are we going to choose life or death, judgment or salvation? It's harsh, but listen, this is truth. And this is what Jesus came to earth to do. And he took three years of his life, the last three years of his life, to tell people this. The kingdom of God is real. And only I can help you. And when I think of salvation, especially that decision, and I know for many, salvation and the experience of salvation is different. For many, it happens in a second. You think of Paul, persecuted Christians on the road to Damascus. He meets Jesus. Jesus blinds him with a light, and he says, why are you persecuting me? He says, Lord, Lord, there's this thing, and he gets saved in a second. He went from killing Christians to becoming the person who would write 13 books of the New Testament. Listen, he got saved in a second. But then there's many people who, who can't say there's a defining moment, this, this time that they chose Jesus, but it's this season where it's, they slowly just became who God wanted them to be and they began to follow Jesus. So time is not what is important. That it happens is important. But, but when this decision takes place, I like to think of it as an explosion of grace. Who's ever been hit by a flower bomb? You fill a balloon with flour and it pops and it goes everywhere, especially on you, you're like, oh, there's like a million particles of flour all over you. And I think, you know, when we choose Jesus, we, we experience this explosion of his grace in the spirit where you and I get covered with particles and every particle represents a blessing of God, where we are consumed, where we are overwhelmed thinking, oh my, what just happened? And it is the best feeling of our lives. When we speak about blessing, you know, you and I do ourselves a disservice when we think of blessing of God. And we think the only blessing of God is my wife, my kids, a nice job, a nice place to stay, a nice wardrobe, the new car, the every upgrade, the phone offers, everything. We think of all these blessings and we pray for those blessings, but, but we neglect the spiritual blessings, the most important blessings that God gives us, spiritual blessings that are ours through salvation. I want you to have some homework. That's some homework for you. Go and read Ephesians 1. And, and, re and read how Paul speaks about the, the spiritual blessings that are ours when we choose Jesus. I'll mention a few of them. He says, you know, when we choose Jesus, he said, we are chosen. He says that we become chosen of God, handpicked by God. Remember soccer, boys, maybe girls, netball. But when you are being selected with all your friends and they're like, we'll pick you, we'll pick you. God says, hey, I'm picking you. I want you on my team. You matter. I want you on my team. That's what happens when we believe in Jesus. Another thing is we get adopted. We get welcomed into a family with God is our father. And we get this family, the church, the spiritual family, a worldwide family. That's a blessing. Another blessing is that you and I get redeemed. We get made God's own, that he buys us. He says, I'm going to pay the price for your soul with the blood of my son. You and I are no longer our own. We belong to God. We are redeemed. Isn't it nice to know that you belong? You and I are redeemed. You and I are forgiven. We're free from the punishment of sin. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That God gives us His own character and power to live in us, to live the life that He wants us to live. Wow, that's a spiritual blessing. And I believe it's these blessings that actually bring soul satisfaction. It's when you go, oh, I've got everything I need in God. And it's when we choose not to follow Jesus and we think, man, where am I going to get soul satisfaction in this world? And I think there's generally three things that we run to. Fame, fortune, and fantasy. We think, if I can just get some of that, then I will be satisfied. They will always leave your hand and allow you to drown. They will never satisfy. They will never save as Jesus saves. So you and I mustn't go to the wrong source, right? You and I would laugh. You would laugh at me if I said, well, please go to the... the the cow and ask it for some honey 
Or, or go to the bee and ask it for some milk. You're like, you're going to the wrong source. You need to ask the milk for, I mean, the cow for milk and the bee for honey, right? And so why, spiritually, why do we go to wrong sources when we know what God can give us? Don't waste time, money, effort, energy, anything on what does not satisfy. Go to God. But I want to close with this. The most amazing thing about our salvation is that you and I almost have nothing to do with it. Almost nothing. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9. God saved you. Who saved you? You did not pick yourself up out of that water. God saved you how? By His grace. He said, you don't deserve it. Imagine like an enemy. He's just stolen your house, burnt your house down, taken your money, done everything, and you see him drowning in a pool. What are you going to do? You're like, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, you would like, mm, sorry, I slipped, forgot. Oh, I try. <laughs> okay. God says, he saved us by his grace. He, he gave us what we didn't deserve. He's like, you are essentially my enemy, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. I'm going to do it, not you. How is it? When you believe. That's the only requirement of our salvation, that we respond. That we simply believe. That's how you and I are saved. And it says, and you can't take credit for this. You can't stand on your own for God. I, I pray every day. I go to church every week. I give to the poor. It doesn't matter. That doesn't earn you salvation. It says, it is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the things, the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. So years ago, it helped me to understand that salvation is more like a necklace than a medal. Okay, what's the difference? One is a gift, one is a reward. Normally, if you and I would get a necklace, it's probably at your birthday time or Christmas that your husband or wife or someone would buy you a necklace at their cost and say, here, have this. It's from me. I paid the price for it. Enjoy it. You didn't do anything to get that necklace. Right? What is a medal? If you run fast, jump high, do something, you get rewarded for doing what you're doing. Salvation is not a reward. It's not a medal. Salvation is a necklace. God says, I'm going to adorn you with salvation. You didn't pay for it. I did with my own blood. That's the power of salvation. D.L. Moody, American evangelist, said this. Salvation is worth working for. It is worth a man's going around the world on his hands and knees, climbing its mountains, crossing its valleys, swimming its rivers, going through all manner of hardship in order to attain it. But we do not get it in that way. It is to him who believes. And this is why Christianity is so puzzling for so many people. They're thinking, must all I do is believe. It's too easy. Surely I must do something. I must make God happy by doing one, two, three. And God says, there is nothing that you can do. Why? Because the credit must come to me because I'm a God that saves. You can't save yourself. And the reality is, church, all of us were or are drowning. And Jesus is saying, I want friendship. I want friendship with you. Martin Luther was well known for, for saying what happens at the point of exchange or of salvation and choosing to follow Jesus is the great exchange where, where Jesus, what happened? It says that Jesus got what we deserved. On the cross, Jesus got what we deserved. What is that? Punishment. And you and I got what he deserved. Freedom. He was innocent. He didn't have to go. We were the guilty ones. We should have gone and paid the price. And yet we got what he deserved. Freedom. And that's why it's so important that Jesus said he's giving us, as the church, two ordinances to hold to. Number one, communion. The second thing, baptism. Because it's those two acts that keep us rooted in our salvation. Whenever you do this, do this in Remembrance of me. Always remember the price I paid for you. Never let it become old news. Let that good news be fresh in you always. And secondly, baptism. It's when you and I say, I've been reborn. This is the new me. That's what it is symbolic of. So if you haven't been baptized, I want to encourage you. It's an important decision to get baptized. Jesus got baptized. And so should you and I. But let me close in this. Acts 4 verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So yes, there's a TV series called Salvation. There's a clothing brand called Salvation. There's a town called Salvation. There's a charity called Salvation. But our salvation really, really matters more than any of those things. I want us to close our eyes this morning. 
And I'm going to ask you the most important decision of your life. Are you saved? Not are you reading a Bible, not do you come to church regularly, not do you serve in a local church, not do you give to charity. Are you saved? Have you reached out to Jesus, cried out for help, recognized these two unavoidable realities of sin and death, realizing that you cannot fix them on your own. You and I are doomed on our own. But it's the love of God that came and said, I want friendship with you. You messed up the relationship, but I want to fix the relationship. That's why I'm sending my son as a sacrifice for your sins and to lift you up out of the grave and into life. And for those of you who know that you've made the decision, you've experienced that resetting of your spiritual DNA, maybe this morning for some of us, we haven't made that decision. Maybe we've got knowledge, but it hasn't become a reality in our lives. And, and I've been praying all week. I asked the team to pray last night. We prayed this morning before service as a team that this morning, someone, at least one, would respond, would reach out and say, Jesus, I'm choosing you. Because you know, Scripture says that all heaven rejoices when one sinner repents. It's the, it's the story of the prodigal son, the lost coin, and the lost sheep. It's all the same thing. The one matters to God. God sees one person saying, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, not only do I need you, but Jesus, I want you. And Jesus, I want friendship with you. So while eyes are closed, heads are bowed, I want to ask you to be courageous. We don't do this often. I want you to stand if that's you this morning. This is something you're saying, Jesus, today is the day. If that's you, stand to your feet this morning. It's a decision that you make. It's not one that God makes for you. For the rest of us, let it be a reminder what Jesus has done for us. Like David said, return to me the joy of my salvation. I think most of us sitting here are guilty of making light of our salvation. Familiarity has bred contempt. That we just, yeah, I'm in a relationship with Jesus. Come on. I pray that we would be overwhelmed by what Jesus has done for us. That it would refresh us, that it would set us on fire again. That we can live the life that God wants us to live. For those standing this morning, Lord, thank you that you see their hearts. Lord, you see the decision that they are making before you and in our company this morning. And I'm praying that your spirit would take them by the hand of their heart and lead them forward into the destiny that you have marked out for them. Lord, give them a confidence in their salvation. Lord, reset their spiritual DNA. Make them a new creature, Lord. We ask this in your precious name. Give them a confidence that their sins are forgiven and that they have the promise of eternity. And we said, Amen. Can we give those people who stood a big hand? So um, for offering this morning, I want to speak about how we can enrich ourselves by, by giving. I mean, the Bible speaks about sowing and reaping um, in Corinthians and uh, I mean, for us, that's not something that we're unfamiliar with. Um, just in our own area, if you drive out of Receville to Mayerton, you see the you see the fields there, the corn fields or the wheat fields. So it's something that we know about. And and even in farmers, I mean, a farmer goes and he sows one seed, and it will produce one plant that will produce multiple heads and multiple seeds within that. So just showing that principle of when you sow, it multiplies two more. Now Paul also speaks about this in two Corinthians nine verse six, where he says. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And it's the same with farmers. The more they sow, the more they reap at the end of the day. But it's a, it's a good principle for us also in our lives. You know, the more we sow, the more we then end up reaping. We are created to give. That's why God created us, giving us one of the highest expressions of humanity. It basically shows that we are dependent on each other as well as also dependent on God. We receive from others so we can give. And the beautiful thing about giving is that you kind of take the focus from your own needs and your own uh, um, 
concerns to those of others and you start caring for others. In giving, we not only express our concerns, but we are also enriched. I mean, the blessing that comes from giving is material, it's emotional, relational, as well as spiritual. And the blessing or the harvest, as we see in the, in the case of the farmers, is always greater than the gift. Like the farmers is the same. Paul also said in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10 to 11, Now he who supplies seeds to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seeds and will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion. And through your generosity, that is the way that we give thanks to God. God provides so that we can give. He wants us to be generous in every occasion. Giving is the power that will take you from being ordinary to extraordinary. The other beautiful thing about giving is that it draws others closer to Jesus within you. You start showing what Jesus is all about. Now, when we talk about our tithes and offerings to the church, that is also important because what that does is it, it allows this caring and this giving to extend further into the community, further to what you and I can do by ourselves. That's why it's important also that we would give to the church. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, this morning that we can read and listen to about the principle of giving, about sowing and reaping, and how wonderful it is that not just the giver but also the receiver is blessed in this. This morning I pray that you would bless every person here in their generosity, even in this week where we go and in everyday life. Thank you, Lord. Okay, just um, in terms of giving, as you go out by the door, by the right-hand side, there's our giving station. And you can give either by snap scan or by uh, card facilities or even just in the envelope if you have money to put in there. Thank you. The most significant decision we could ever make is to follow Jesus. And we choose to follow him because he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And I hope you're just as encouraged as I am that repentance is a loving invitation. May we all please stand to our feet. Just before I bless all of us, um, just a beautiful reminder that we have the best coffee in the, in the whole of Vereniging. And just as Pastor Angie mentioned, um, friendship is God's plan. So please take the time to make a friend. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.